Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace. Chapter 2. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. see someone walking around with earbuds in, do you ever wonder, are they listening to the Bible? Because they could be. This Christmas season, we're looking at the Christmas story from a very unique perspective. We're going to the Old Testament, and we're looking at some of the more than 60 prophecies that are prophesying the coming Messiah. So the Old Testament writers, centuries before, different writers, different times, different places, inspired by the same Holy Spirit are pointing and saying a Messiah will come. And they're giving specific information about the Messiah. And then we discover that, that, that in those more than 60 prophecies, when Jesus came, he fulfilled all of those prophecies. And, and now we're saying, so, so, so it was prophesied, Jesus came, but because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, we're asking the question, well, what does that mean for our lives? Does the Jesus who was prophesied, the Jesus who came, the Jesus who rose again and who lives on us by his spirit, is he doing something today? This is the journey we're on each week of this Christmas season. And so, so in one of, the, one of the passages we looked at was from 700 BC in the book of Isaiah, where we're told a virgin will conceive and bear a son and his name will be Emmanuel, which means God with us. And Jesus comes, born of a virgin. And his name is Emmanuel. He is God with us. And so we talked about how just the reality that because he's with us, we're never alone. We walk in his presence. He's with us today. We looked at another prophecy in the book of Isaiah where, where Isaiah is pointing forward and Isaiah says, he will be called, his name will be the Prince of Peace. And in a war-torn, crazy world, man, you're longing for that. They were then, we are today. Jesus comes and the angels declare, peace on earth to, to those on whom his favor rests, that Jesus came bearing the peace of God. And that just, that, that just teaches us that, that if we have come to the cross and received Jesus, if we have a relationship with Jesus, we bear that peace because the Prince of Peace lives in us and everywhere we go should become more peaceful through the presence of Jesus Christ. Today, as we look at the prophets, we're looking at three different things that were prophesied and all three things are about where Jesus was from, where he came from, where, what his origins were. And there's three different prophecies Talking about three different locations. And it's interesting when, when you interact with people, as we look at the, the Messiah and the surprising origins of the Messiah, we, you know, we, when we interact with people, we'll often say to them, hey, tell me your story. Where are you from? And everybody's story, if you'll slow down and listen, everyone's story is interesting. Everyone's story is. If you'll just slow down and, and hear their story. And around shoreline, if you say to somebody, hey, where are you from? Tell me your story, your background. It can get really interesting because we have a lot of military and people who are in lots of different places. So their story is often a patchwork of different places and locations and, and where they're from. And so we, we asked one family, uh, the, the Robinson family, if we could share a little bit of their story. And so you'll see the Robinson family up here. If you say, well, tell us about your story. Where, where are you from? And these are shoreliners. They're part of our church here. So where are you from? Well, Jared, the dad would say, well, you know, I, I, I'm from Phoenix, Arizona. That's where I, I started at least. A lot of military folks, if you say, where you're from, they're kind of like, you know, lots of places, right? They go, I'm, I've, been, I've been a lots of places, I'll be a lot of places, but, but that's where Jared came from. Uh, he met Emily, and they got married. She's from Greenville, Texas. But then if you ask their daughter, McKenna, well, where are you from? She said, well, I'm from, I'm from Yuna, Yuma, Arizona, which means, well, that's where the other kids are from, right? No. Uh, if you ask Carter, where are you from? Well, Stafford, Virginia. And if you ask Nora, where are you from? New Bern, North Carolina. 
Because so it's, it's complicated where, where we're from. But, but that's oftentimes you know, our, our stories. And I was, thinking about, I was thinking about Jared. If you could have gone to Jared when he was like 15 or 16 years old. And say, hey, Jared, listen, listen. This is really interesting. One day you're going to meet this beautiful young woman named Emily. You're going to marry her. And, and she's going you know, to be from Texas. And then you're going to have a little girl in Arizona. Then you're going to have a little boy in Virginia. Then you're going to have a little girl in North Carolina. You know, if you threw that at 15 or 16, you know, if you prophesied that over him. You know what you'd probably say? Tell me more about Emily. Because yeah. I said he was 15 or 16, right? Uh, but, and the other stuff would be important. But you know, yeah, yeah, I, I got a wife coming, okay. But, uh, but, but there's a complexity to the human journey. But what we're going to discover today is the God who's sovereign over the universe is sovereign over our story. And that God is sovereign over the story of Jesus. Because if you went to Jesus when he was you know, 30 years old, I said, Jesus, tell me your story. Where'd you grow up? Where are you, where are you from? Jesus would have probably said something like this. Well, it's kind of a funny story. And most of our stories are kind of interesting. But he always said, it's kind of a funny story. You know, originally, actually from heaven. Right? But you're, you're, asking, but you're asking right now, where are you from? Where were you born? Or where were you raised? Where do you come from? And here's what Jesus would have said. He said, well, I'm, I'm from Nazareth. But I'm from Bethlehem. But I'm from Egypt. And in the ancient world where there was no tra trains, planes, or automobiles or a way to get around, how is one person from Nazareth, from Bethlehem, and from Egypt? And Egypt's kind of way off the map at that time in history. To, to get there was a, quite a complex process. But, but, but Jesus would say there's surprising and, uh, surprising and strange origins. And so, so look at this map here. That's where Jesus is from. So how, are, how, are you, how can you be from Nazareth, from Bethlehem, and from Egypt? But here's the interesting thing. All three of those were prophesied in the Old Testament. The Messiah will be a Nazarene, which means they come from Nazareth. If you say, well, I'm a Californian, I come from California. If you're a Nazarene, you come from Nazareth. But, but the Messiah will also be from Bethlehem. And also out of Egypt, the prophet, the prophet says, I've called my son. He'll be from Egypt. All of those were prophesied. This is where Jesus is from. And if you would have tried to predict that, you say, well, it can't be done. Well, actually, the prophets predicted that in over 60 prophecies, and they all came true. So, so that's an amazing thing when you realize the staggering nature of this. So I want to follow the strange journey of Jesus, and I want you to see that sometimes the things that lead us on our journey aren't always the things we would expect or want. And if I was writing my journey, have you ever looked at your life journey and what's happened? Have you ever thought, well, if I was in charge, and God, I'm not telling you your business, but you know, I, would have, I would have redone, I would have done things a little differently. But, but, but Jesus' journey is interesting, and some of the things that took him where he was were challenging things. So, so Nazareth is, is kind of where he grew up and where he kind of landed after a time, but Bethlehem is where he was born. Well, if he's from Nazareth, why is he born in Bethlehem? Well, because of a government edict. The government sometimes says, you got to go somewhere. If you're in the military, you know what I'm talking about. But the government said, you need to go to your, your family's home of origin, and for Joseph and Mary, that was Bethlehem. So they travel there, and when they travel there, she's pregnant. She gets there. The place is packed with people because everyone's going to register because they're following this edict of the king. And so they can't find a place. They end up in a, in, a, you know, in a little barn area, and Jesus is born. So he's from Bethlehem, but he's from Nazareth. Well, why does he say he came from Egypt? Well, be, because now Egypt comes into the picture. After Jesus is born, the guy who's king at the time, Herod, gets word that a king has been born. And Herod's like, I'm the king. And in the old world, in that time, when you're the king and you hear a king's been born, you want to make sure you take that person out before they get old enough to become king. So he basically starts having boys slaughtered in the area that this prophecy was given. And so an angel comes to Joseph and Mary and says, out of Bethlehem, you know, you're not going back to Nazareth, go to Egypt. Of all the places the angel could have sent them, why Egypt? Well, because a prophet had said a long time ago, out of Egypt, I call my son. So down to Egypt they go, and then they come back out of Egypt. And so this interesting story of Jesus, where he's from Nazareth, from Bethlehem, and from Egypt. All of them prophesied. So if you have your Bibles, you can try to follow along. I would suggest what you do is just listen to these passages as, as I read them. As you know, most, most of you know, on the website, all of my sermon notes for every sermon are on the website. So you can pull, all these are there, and you can pull them up later and have those available to you if you're trying to remember them. But I want you mostly to listen to how the prophets prophesied and how Jesus fulfilled these three different prophecies. The first one, the prophecy and fulfillment of Nazareth. Matthew 2.23 says this. 
And he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So that was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. And there's a couple different prophecies of the Old Testament that point to the coming Messiah as being a Nazarene. And now Jesus, then his family moves to Nazareth. So he is now a Nazarene. And that prophecy is fulfilled. In Micah 5, 2 in the Old Testament, it prophesies about another place. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. It's prophesying the coming of Jesus. And the fulfillment is found in Matthew 2, 1 through 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to the Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So again, a prophecy, Bethlehem. Jesus is born in Bethlehem. Even though he's not from Bethlehem, he's born there. And then Hosea 11.1 1 says, When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. There's the prophetic word. And Matthew 2, 14 to 15 says this. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt. and got that warning in a dream to get out of town and get to Egypt. He left for Egypt where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Here's the lesson. The sovereign God guides through every step of the journey. Do you understand this? That the God who is sovereign over the universe not only had the prophecies come of the Messiah, not only guided the journey of Jesus, but that God guides our journey and he is sovereign. He rules. He reigns. And we say to ourselves sometimes, wait a minute. Sometimes things happen that are really bad and really messy and things that, that, that I think shouldn't have happened. Saying that God is sovereign and that he rules over all of history doesn't mean that God causes everything that happens. There's brokenness and sin in our world. But what God can do is he can redeem the broken things and make something out of them that we couldn't imagine or dream. God is not the author of evil. God conquers evil. But in this world at this time, there are things that happen through brokenness and through pain and through people's bad choices and our own bad choices and the sins of humanity that are painful and dark. But God's still on the throne, and through all of that, God can navigate our lives forward. I mean, Jesus' journey involved an edict from a king, go to Bethlehem, involved a crazy king killing babies, and a vision basically saying, get out of town and go to Egypt. That's, that's some messy stuff in there. But God's on the throne over and through all of that. We have to understand that for our lives as well. I love the story of Joseph, and I just want to give you, in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, the very beginning of the Bible there, uh, it, it's going through the, the history of God's people, and this guy Joseph is a, is a young boy, he's got a bunch of older brothers, and they don't like him because they think that dad favors him, because dad favors him, and so uh, they don't like him, so, there's, so, so, so for Joseph, and if you haven't read this, read the story in the book, it's, it's at the end of the book of Genesis, there's family turmoil, there's sibling rivalry and conflict in the family, it's a messy situation, He's abandoned and his brothers actually sell him as a slave to some traders coming through and he's taken off to Egypt. And he's imprisoned there. He's sold, basically as cattle, as a slave. He lives a righteous life, but there's false accusations. So then he's thrown into prison. And while he's in prison, he does everything right and things still turn out wrong. At some point along the way, you gotta say, Joseph's gonna go, okay, God, if you're on the throne and you're in charge of the universe, my life isn't panning out very well here. But he kept holding to God through the midst of all the mess that he experienced. And he had a sense that God was on the throne. Now with time, Joseph ascended out of the prison to a role of leadership through a series of dreams that he interprets. He becomes responsible to help Egypt get ready for a prophesied famine that's coming. So they stockpile food so that when the famine comes, the whole world comes knocking on their door to buy food. And guess who comes knocking on their door? Joseph's brothers. But by now, Joseph speaks Egyptian fluently. He dresses like an Egyptian. He talks like an Egyptian. Dare I say? I don't need to say that. Uh, but you know, but he, he, he's, he's become, he, he still holds to God, but outwardly, you look at him, he's an Egyptian. And his brothers come begging for food, asking for, you know, asking for it to trade for food. 
They don't even recognize that little brother. He's become a man. And when they find out who it is, he doesn't judge and condemn them. He cares for them. After a little bit of some challenges and some kind of things. But he finally gets them around. He says, I'm going to take care of you. But they're still terrified. They're thinking, Joseph's going to turn against us. He's going to kill us. He's not going to provide for us because of what we did to him in his past. And in one of the most amazing passages in all the Bible, in Genesis 50, 19 to 21, Joseph looks at his brothers. He sees the fear in their eyes. Thinking, basically they're thinking, if, if someone did that to me, I would get back at them. But that's not where Joseph's heart is at. And here's what he says. Genesis 50, 19. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. This is to his brothers. Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? I'm not going to take God's place. He says, am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me. What you did was wrong. It was, it was, that was your intention. You intended to harm me. But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. He's saying, you think you sold me here. God sent me here. God's on the throne. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph understood that even in the darkness of his darkest times, and even though there were things that were done out of evil intent, God was still on the throne. The same God who said, when the Messiah comes, he will be from Nazareth, he will be from Bethlehem, and he will be from Egypt. How do you do that? Well, it was all fulfilled through a whole series of things that would seem from a human standpoint to be strange and, and sometimes almost evil and wrong, what Herod was doing. And, and yet, through all of that, God brought the Messiah, the Savior, into the world to offer salvation, to free us from our sins, to show us his love. It's amazing. So the question becomes then, you know, what about your journey? What about your journey? What about my journey? You know, is, is God watching over us? Is God sovereign? And so the question, what about your journey? Let me give you three responses, three realities. And you'll see these up on the screen. First, God is on the throne. Second, God's hand is on you. And third, God cares about your story. God, in your story, whether some of you, many of you have come to the cross and you've received Jesus Christ. You say, I'm a Christian. I've confessed my wrongs. I've accepted the forgiveness of Jesus. He's leading my life. And I can say to you, God is on the throne in your life. God's hand is on you. And God cares about your story. He's guiding you through your story. His hand is upon your life. Some of you are at a place where you say, I, I've come to church some, or maybe this is my first time, and I've heard some about Jesus. Maybe I haven't heard anything, but I've never received Jesus and become his follower. Can I tell you that God's still on the throne? He may not be ruling your life specifically because you're not yielding to him, but he's still on the throne over all human history. And also God's hand is on you. You say, well, if I'm not a Christian, how is God's hand on me? I don't know how to explain it exactly, but I can tell you this. When I look back on my life, the fact that I was born to the home of Robert Terrence Harney and Patricia Ann Van Brott when they got married, Patricia Ann Harney, my dad and my mom, and I look back at my life long before, I mean, my parents were kind of atheistic, agnostic, there was no faith in our home, but I look at, at the, my journey and what God did, and God's hand was on me through all of that. And I don't think I would be standing here preaching right now if it wasn't for the family I grew up in, because God shaped me through that. God's, even though I didn't know Jesus, even though my parents didn't know Jesus, I will tell you this, the hand of God was on me every moment of my life growing up, even in the hard, dark moments. I believe that for you, even if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, and certainly if you are. And God cares about your story. If you're a Christian, God cares about every day of your life. And if you're not, God wants to see you come to know him and to know his love and to write a story that is so filled with joy and beauty and power it would blow your mind as you walk in his presence. I believe that we need to learn to walk with an awareness of the presence of God in our lives and his, and his sovereignty, his power, his hand over us. One of my favorite psalms in the Bible of the 150 psalms that are in the Bible is Psalm 139. If you have a Bible, you can turn there. If you have your, your phone or your, your tablet and you have your Bible app open, go to Psalm 139. And I want to read just some of the passages. I want you to get this picture of just this declaration of who God is and how he knows us and his hand upon our lives. Psalm 139, beginning in verse 2. David, the psalmist, says, You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. God, you know, you know what's going through my mind. You discern my going out, my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. If you jump to verse 7, David says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Is there anywhere I can go, God, where you're not there? And I love the response. He says, If I go to the heavens, you're there. 
If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. And then verse 13, it gets really intimate. David says, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. You can't get any more intimate than that. David says, before I breathe the air of this world in my mother's womb, he says, God, you shape me and you form me in my mother's womb. He, God was touching this beautiful life of David, and he does of us too. Verse 14, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And then in verse 16, he goes to the beginning of his life and to the end of his life. And he says, your eyes saw my unformed body. He's back in the womb again at the beginning. Your eyes saw my unformed body. And listen to this. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. All the days of my life were written in your book before one of them came to be. I took my first philosophy class in college, and I studied, I've studied a lot, I've read a lot, I've studied theology. And if you say, try to explain that 16th verse of Psalm 139, God's sovereignty, God's wisdom, God's knowledge of all things, and human free will and how all that works, I would say to you, I don't know. I don't know how to fit all. I can't give you some simple little tidy answer, but I know this. Every day of your life is under the hands of the God who loves you and who made you. And he longs to be in relationship with you. And if he is in relationship with you, he longs to be in closer relationship. God's that engaged with our lives. And every part of our life matters. So when we understand what the prophets have prophesied, in this case we're talking about this prophecy of the strange origins of the Messiah. He will be a Nazarene and he'll come out of Egypt and he'll be born in Bethlehem, all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Then we realize that what we need to do is learn to walk in the presence of the sovereign God. This Christmas and every day. We need to learn to walk in the presence of the sovereign God. What does that look like? To walk in his presence. Aware that God is sovereign. He's ruling the universe and he's involved in our lives. If you're a note taker, you can write these down. But here's five things that, that I think are pictures of walking in the presence of the sovereign God. This Christmas time and every day of our lives. Here's the first thing. I will thank God for his amazing gifts. And how do I do that? There's, there's five looks here. Here's what I'll do. I will look around. I'll look around. I will thank God for his amazing gifts. How do I thank God for his amazing gifts? Watch, this is what you do. Everybody watch, this is really easy. <laughs> you just look around. You look around the beauty of Monterey, the beauty of the Salinas Valley. You say, Lord, what beauty, what gifts you've given. You look around your home. And all these things that sit around that you've forgotten about that were so... You know, you go, this is a gift, and this is a gift, and this is a gift. You look around the people around you, the greatest of gifts, and you say, God, thank you, and thank you, and thank you. I will thank God for his gifts. So what I'll do, I'll look around, and, and, and I'll see those things, and I'll give thanks to him. Second, I will notice how the Holy Spirit of God has guided and guides my steps. So I'll look back. As I walk through my life, I'm going to recognize how the Holy Spirit of God, he's guided my steps, he guides my steps, so I'm walking through my life and I'm pressing forward and we're always, you know, what's next and what's the next experience and boy, what am I going to do so I can you know, post this on my, on my Instagram or on my Facebook and I can share with the word and all these things I'm going to do and it's all going to be exciting, but sometimes we stop and we do this. We look back over our shoulder at where we've come from and say, God, all the ways that you've loved and provided and watched over me and protected. And all the crazy things we've done as kids along the way, and you know, God, you've protected. And you see God's hand, and we remember, and we thank God for those things. We, we look back and remember. Third, I will celebrate my journey more and complain less. I will look at my mouth. How do you look at your mouth? You look in the mirror. You look at that mouth and say, you know, I'm, I'm going to celebrate more. And I'm going to complain less. Let me ask you a question. If you really looked around your life, is there at least one thing you can find that you can be thankful for and celebrate? What's the answer? Yeah. Try that again. If you looked at your life closely, is there at least one thing you can celebrate? What's the answer? Yeah. Let me ask you another honest question. If you looked at your life and were honest, is there at least one thing you can complain about? What's the answer? Yeah. But you decide. You decide every day that, that I'm going to I'm going to thank God. 
I'm going to see the good things. I'm going to remember. And, and, and I'm, and I'm going to see how God moves and how God leads. And, and, and just, I'm going to look at my mouth and say, let me be one who speaks words of celebration and blessing. That's a choice we make every day. When I feel down, I will look up and back and recognize his hand. I'll look up. When I feel down, when I'm struggling, when times are tough, I'm going I'm to look up to God and say, God, and from the pit that I feel like I'm in, I can still see you, so I look up to you. And, and I'm going to look back, and I'm going to remember God's goodness and God's grace and God's power. And then I will hold the hand of Jesus, who is writing my story, because he is always with me. And sometimes that has to be enough. I will look to Jesus. As I walk through my life, I'll hold the hand of Jesus and I'll look to him. And I'll know, I'll be reminded of his presence and his strength and his goodness. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll look at the journey he sent me on and I'll look at how he's led me and how he's guided me. There's, there's something about, about, about looking around and being thankful. There's something about looking up to God. There's something about looking at our mouths. There's something about, about looking up to God. And there's something about looking back and saying, God, you've been so good. If you stop and look at your life, there's just blessing upon blessing upon blessing. Has your life been perfect? What's the answer? No. Are there hard things you've had to navigate? Absolutely. And if you know Jesus and you hold his hand, he's with you there through it. I, I've been trying this little discipline that um, Jeff Mannion, when he's here and preached, encouraged us to do, and that is to every day, at the end of the day or the next morning, write down three things you're thankful for for the day before. And so this morning, I sat with my journal and I wrote down three things from yesterday that I was thankful for. Just saying, God, I want to train my heart to, to look up to God and thank him and to look back and see what he's done. And as I was writing the things I was thankful for, what came to my mind was a picture that I had texted to me yesterday. My, my wife, Sherry, and all three of my sons and their wives are all down in Los Angeles at a wedding of a friend of ours who's actually often plays keyboard here at Shoreline, but he got married on a Sunday, which means I'm here preaching and my whole family is down there at his wedding. But because they were down in L.A., uh, my firstborn grandchild, my only grandchild, uh, got to meet my dad yesterday. And so my dad, and that's his, that's his first child's child's child. <laughs> and so he's a great grandpa, and he has been since Colin was born, but he'd never seen him. And so um, I got on my phone this picture of my dad, who I didn't know if he'd live long enough. He's a lot of health challenges. I didn't know if he'd ever see his great grandkids. And I just picture my dad holding his great grandson, and the delight on my dad's face, and the delight on little Cohen's face. And I wrote in my journal, God, thank you that my dad got to see his son's son's son. Because there's those gifts and those blessings every single day. It's, a, it's just looking and noticing. The prophets prophesied a Messiah, a Savior will come. It's going to be kind of strange. And you don't have to unfold. But he's from Nazareth, he's from Bethlehem, and he's from Egypt. And that all happened in God's timing because God is over all of life and all of history. And, and then for our lives, we look and say, God, do you really rule the universe? And, and I want to say as we, as we close our time today, I want to pray in two directions today with two groups of people. I want to pray with those of you that have come to the cross, you've received Jesus whether it was a month ago or whether it was 70 years ago. You came to the cross and you've received Jesus. You know him and you love him. And I want to give you a chance to pray to him today and say, God, I want to know you more. I want to love you more. I want to notice your goodness. I want to take your hand and follow you more closely. I'm going to give you a chance to pray and just say, God, that's me. I know you, but I want to know you more and I want to recognize your hand on my life. And then I also want to pray with those of you who would say, I've been coming to church for a while. I've heard about Jesus, but, but I, want, I want to know Jesus today. I want to come to Jesus and I, and I want to acknowledge that Jesus, I understand the love of God, that God, that God you love me right where I'm at with all, with all my challenges and brokenness. God, I recognize your love for me. But you can pray and say, God, and I recognize that I'm separate from you because of wrong things I've done. The Bible calls those sins. I've thought things I shouldn't think. I've said things I shouldn't do. I've done things I shouldn't have done. And those sins separate me from you. But God, I want to confess that you love me so much. You sent Jesus. That's what Christmas is all about. You sent Jesus to come, the perfect lamb of God, and to give his life for me, God with us. And he took my sins, and I want to receive Jesus. And now I want to take his hand, and I want to walk with him the rest of my life. I want to give you a chance to become a follower of Jesus today if you haven't and if you want to. And as I was praying about this this morning, God put, actually put on my heart that, that, 
that there, that particularly there's some young people and high, you know, high, junior high, high school age and young adults, young military people, college students that have been around the church for a while but haven't yet been able to say yes to Jesus. And that maybe this is the first Christmas you actually celebrate Christmas as one who knows what it's really all about, that you've met Jesus. So let's, let's go to prayer together. I wanna invite you, if you're here in this room or if you're in the family worship venue or if you're online, if you say, I've come to the cross, I've received Jesus, I believe in him, but I want to know him more, I want to live for him more, I want to follow him with greater joy and greater passion, you say, I want to go deeper in this new year, deeper in my walk with Jesus, and that's your heart's desire, I'm going to ask that you would raise your hand right now, really high, and keep it up. I've got my hand up, but I'm going to keep up the whole, just raise it high, just, just, just sort of raise it to the Lord and say, Jesus, I believe in you, but my, I'm, I'm saying right now, as I raise my hand, I'm going to pray right now, I want to know you more, I want to love you more, I want to follow you more. And I'm going to ask you to do something. If you have your hand raised, just those who have their hands raised, keep it up high and look up at me because the Bible actually never tells us we have to pray with our eyes closed. We can pray with our eyes wide open. And so, Lord Jesus, many of us have our hand raised up high. And we are saying today, Jesus, we believe in you. We thank you that you've written the story of our life. In the dark parts of our journey, they've been hard and painful. You've been with us. And the beautiful times you've been with us, we want to remember those good times. And we are saying with our hand raised high, Jesus, lead me into this new year. Let me love you more, follow you more passionately, find more joy in you, share your love more freely with others. Lead me, Lord Jesus, I pray in your name. Okay, put your hands down if that's you. And then I want to ask, if you're here in the worship center or in the family worship venue or online, if you're online, you can type in something, there'll be a pastor ready to respond to you. And if you're in the family worship venue, we've got a pastor, I think it's Pastor Sean up at the front. Uh, and if you, if you right now, uh, here in the worship center, any of those places, if you say, I have never said yes to Jesus, but I want to open that. I know that he offers the gift. He offers his life, his forgiveness and a new life. And I want to today receive that gift and open up and say, Jesus, I want to become your follower. If that's you today, I want you to raise your hand in the worship center here and raise your hand high and just, say, just to say, that's me today. I want, to, I want to become a follower of Jesus today. Just raise your hand high. I'm going to try to look up in the balcony here. Okay, so right there. And if, and if your hand's high, look, go ahead and look up at me. So right there, in the, about five rows up in the balcony, right there, okay. Just keep your hand up in the air there. Anybody else? Anyone else? And I'm not going to drag a long time, but if this is your heart, and you say, this is the time I want to, to give my heart to Jesus and become his follower. All right, and if you're in the family worship venue, look up at Pastor Sean, and if you're online, send a note into our pastor. And if some, the, there's parts of the worship center that are dark that I may not see you, but if your hand is raised high, keep your hand high in the air, and we, let's pray together at home and in the family worship venue and in here, and say, Lord Jesus Christ, thank you that you've watched over my life, that you know my journey, that you love me, you know all of my sins, but I pause and confess them to you right now. And I say, Jesus, wash me clean. Jesus, give me new life. Jesus, forgive my sins. And Jesus, I take your hand right now and I will follow you all the days of my life knowing that you've already written them down in your book. And Jesus, thank you that this Christmas I celebrate knowing what it's all about, knowing you, Jesus. And Lord, for all of us gathered here, and online in the family worship venue. We love you. We want to follow you. For those that know you already or that have said yes to you today, help us walk closely to you. And Lord, for those people who have not yet said yes to Jesus, and maybe they're just not ready, they, don't, they just still have questions or struggles, I pray that they would know that this is a place they can stay and be engaged and learn and keep walking towards Jesus. And Jesus, as we leave this place, may we walk in your presence this Christmas season knowing that your hand is upon our lives and you are leading us every step of the way. We pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen.